to some leeway. <laughs> but anyways, so this, uh, this talk is about uh, the, the, some solutions. Oh, I'm looking for my mouse. Where is my mouse? OK. This talk is about uh, some solution that we try to design in order to get uh, better uh, I.O. performance when doing raw packet I.O. And uh, so the title is a bit more ambitious than the actual content of the talk, but perhaps uh, that uh, will uh, uh, solicit some discussion and some feedback uh, from you guys. And this is a joint work with uh, some of my former students and mentioned there and supported by the European Commission in a project called uh, Change. So uh, the, the background is that some applications, several of them, uh, need to do packet I.O. at very high rates. The line rate for uh, 10 gig interface is up to 14.88 million packets per second. Of course, this is not the common case when you're doing TCP, but uh, it's a, a case that you must be able to deal with when you're doing routing or software switching or just traffic uh, monitoring. And the problem is that uh, packet I.O. on commodity operating systems, such as FreeBSD, Linux, or Windows, is usually very slow. The best figures uh, that you can get are around a million packet per second independently uh, of the operating system and, uh, and, uh, and the hardware, uh, per core actually. So if you're lucky and uh, uh, your uh, network stack is well parallelized, you can get a slightly better performance by having more cores pushing traffic out or reading traffic from, from the car. There are some solutions that are custom ones. Uh, for instance, SolarFlare has its own uh, uh, user space library, uh, open on load. Intel has the PDK, maybe other, other um, hardware manufacturers have their own libraries to exercise the card in a, a much better way than the operating system uh, can do. But uh, the, the problem I was trying to address is whether we can do this in a more systematic way and uh, uh, have uh, our uh, standard operating system make our operating system able to do traffic, uh, packet I.O. at very high rate. And perhaps there is a the design problem in the OS. Perhaps we're using uh, techno techniques or uh, too much layering or uh, software, uh, software architecture, which is too old, which was appropriate uh, 30 years ago, but now doesn't work well anymore with the current, uh, uh, the current generation of uh, very high speed uh, links. So the, the answer, the quick answer is that yes, we can do better. And uh, NetMap uh, is one way to uh, achieve this result. It's a prototype that we developed, uh, de developed on FreeBSD and now recently ported uh, to Linux. Um, last time I was in, in this room and I gave a talk and there was Linux in the title and three people in the room. Everybody else was in the other one. So. <laughs> Anyways, this time it's going better. <clears throat> the, the graph below shows the uh, I will come back to this, but uh, shows the, the throughput of the traffic generator, and this is similar for traffic sync, when using NetMap, uh, varying the, uh, the clock speed of the CPU. And you can see that with NetMap, we can do line rate at about 900 megahertz with just a single core. By comparison, if you use uh, uh, just a standard uh, UDP socket, uh, you're barely able using uh, NetSend, which is one of the programs in FreeBSD and uh, all the others, uh, uh, NetPair for, or, or so, are, have similar performance. You're barely able to do one million packets per second. Uh, this, uh, this curve up here is uh, for a packet gen, which is a Linux module, an internal traffic generator, which uh, talks directly to the device driver and is able to do four million packets per second. But uh, that's a, a, for a very specific task. And uh, it's a kernel kind of module that cannot do anything else. And, and you see that there is a still a factor of 10 in performance between uh, what we can do with NetMap and what uh, the, the specific Linux, uh, Linux solution can do. Now, uh, our solution is independent from the hardware. Uh, device driver support is, is, very, is very simple. It's independent from the OS. We have a free BSD and Linux version. And I'm hoping the other BSD people will be able <laughs> to uh, take the source and importing them in the tree. And uh, seems to have good scalability with CPU frequency and number of cores. Of course, it solves a, a limited uh, problem, which is raw packet I.O. And uh, now the, the challenge will be to uh, make use of this uh, uh, facility, uh, for instance, in the TCP stack or 
with, with uh, virtual machines, uh, etc. But still, it's a starting point, and there are a lot of applications who uh, really make use of this uh, uh, kind of performance. And uh, also, we have a LIPICAP emulation library, which is very simple and efficient. And uh, so we have a, a number of applications that are already able to make use of this uh, feature uh, of NetMap, so the, the fast I.O. capabilities of NetMap, by, by just uh, running on top of our uh, LIPICAP uh, uh, library. The summary of the talk is uh, the following, then. I, I will start uh, trying to figure out uh, where the, the cost in packet processing is in the current network stack by measuring the performance of uh, some application and uh, trying to figure out how, how much time is spent in the various layers. And then I will present the NetMap API, its internals, a uh, uh, few hints on the performance, and uh, discuss some experience on porting application and the, net, the future work that uh, might be done on, on NetMap, extending it or, or trying to use it uh, within our network stack. So the, our network stack has several layers, and uh, packets are passed from one to the other, and probably not in the most efficient way. But <laughs> I, I searched for bureaucracy. <laughs> what comes out? So I took my test machines, which is uh, uh, i7, uh, 870 uh, Intel CPU, uh, 2.93 gigahertz, plus Turbo Boost, uh, 10 gig interface. I have the Intel card, which, is, which I'm using, but that's not the bottleneck anyways. And uh, these measurements were taken uh, on FreeBSD AMD64 uh, as of last month. And the, the tool that I used uh, was a traffic generator, NetSend, uh, in, it's in our source tree, on a connected socket, just to I, I was trying to avoid the, all the expensive operations, so I used a connected socket because otherwise the internal processing is more expensive. I enabled flow cache because I found out that otherwise just the route lookups is terribly expensive. I took away IPFW, IPv6, uh, any, anything else that would use the filter hooks just to make the processing as fast as possible in the kernel. And this is what I got. Um, I, I start, so the, how, how did I do the measurement? I take my application and uh, I insert the breakpoints, not really breakpoints, I insert return instructions in, in various places through, through, uh, through the path, from the, right before the, the system call and then in various points in the, in the kernel. So for instance, uh, uh, the way to read the, this, this table is the following. In, in this line I mentioned send to, which means that the breakpoint is just before the call to the, to the send to. And, uh, the, uh, the time for each iteration is just eight nanoseconds. So it means that my application is able to issue a system call every eight nanoseconds. Uh, of course, uh, um, if I do uh, issue the system call, then I, I need to enter into the kernel, and that's more expensive, and then the running time becomes 104 nanoseconds, which means probably that just the, uh, the system call, this is on MD64, takes about 100 nanoseconds. Then I move down the, to the next uh, call in, in, in the stack. Uh, it's uh, send it, uh, and then I have kernel send it, and those are pretty cheap. Uh, then I have so send, uh, which I have not instrumented, and then I have so send gram. In the body of so send gram, uh, before going to the next uh, layer, UDP send, I see that uh, we spend uh, about 149 seconds. And that's apparently, uh, I mean, I'm, li I'm listing here the operations that are done between these two layers. So there is a SOC buff uh, lock and unlock, uh, and then buff allocation and the copy in. The combination of this operation is taking this much time. Then I have U sorry, UDP send, which is quite cheap. Uh, UDP output uh, uh, is moderately more expensive. Uh, I don't remember exactly which operations are done there, but it's 60 nanoseconds. Now, these are not peanuts. Our budget at, on a 10 gig interface is 60 nanoseconds per packet. So, it's very limited, and, and so we are interested in, uh, in even small amounts uh, of, of time. IP output uh, is quite expensive, about almost 200 nanoseconds, and that's even with the, the flow cache. Uh, we have a uh, root lookup, uh, IP address setup, so, and there are many, many cases which uh, we need to take care of. Uh, either output is also surprisingly expensive, and uh, apparently does a MAC header lookup, uh, ARP, uh, Look up or something like that. Then there are three separate copies of the of the components of the header: six bytes, six bytes, another two, 
And I found out that, for instance, bcopy on a 6 byte is much more expensive than a bcopy on a 64 bytes uh, chunk. Just the alignment or the size of the operand uh, makes a big difference. And those are whole hints that we, we could use to optimize our, our data path. Uh, then we move down to the device driver, and uh, we see that, for instance, just the transmit routine and the IXGBA driver, but I think all the uh, similar, which basically takes the chain of MBUFs and uh, uh, copies the pointer to the, to the, uh, to the actual uh, buffers into the NIC ring, is taking almost uh, 220 nanoseconds. Between that and programming the interface, yes. This is on a single CPU. I also have done a single, sorry, a single version of program running or multiple versions? Single version of program okay, running. So you're going to talk about multiple versions. I, I don't have the numbers here because I don't think I have the time to do that. But okay. I've, done, I've, I've run some measurement. I'm going to uh, give out the, the code so okay. people can rerun the, the test themselves. But basically what I found out, uh, just a quick hint, with having multiple versions of the program running, uh, there was a lot of contention on the uh, IP output without the flow cache and much better behavior with, uh, with the flow cache. And also the device driver is pretty good and uh, the, the socket is pretty good. I mean, the, the, the re only real contention point that I found in output was on IP output. On the input side, it's different because, uh, well, it's trickier to, to measure the, the, the path because uh, you are doing a receive, but uh, all, all the thing happens when the packet comes in. So. It, you don't really have a good way to measure things. But uh, the, the problem is that uh, if your source uh, is uh, sending on, on, a, on a single socket, basically, even with the flow director, all the traffic is going to a single queue. So it's difficult to parallelize. Anyways, so I don't have better, uh, good tests on, on the seed path. But just on the, on the transmit path, uh, we see that there are several expensive operations, and they are spread throughout uh, the, the entire stack. Now, um, what does it mean? That if we want to get uh, uh, another magnitude improvement in throughput, we really have to address all these, uh, these parts, otherwise uh, we are not going to get uh, great benefits. Uh, there are some things that cannot be avoided. For instance, uh, um, some, some uh, custom libraries uh, or some custom solutions try to expose uh, everything to user space, so including the NIC registers, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, rely on uh, hardware protection, uh, IO, MMU, or stuff like that to make sure that the application cannot crash the, the rest of the system. I, I didn't want to use those solutions, so in my, in my view, the system call can, cannot be avoided. It's also, an, it, it is moderately expensive, but it's also a nice way to uh, isolate the user space from, from the rest of the, the system. Uh, so the, the, the solution to reduce the cost of the system call is amortize it uh, over a, a large batches of packets. There are um, some other things that uh, uh, contribute to the cost. For instance, uh, we have variable and buff sizes, and uh, that makes uh, programming the device expensive. And this is an explanation. If you were to play Tetris, which kind of blocks would you like? The, the one on the right or the one on the left? Uh, surely, if you're doing it for fun, this solution is nicer. But uh, if you're doing for business, probably you want uh, everything, all the blocks look the same and uh, spend as little as work uh, as possible in, uh, in uh, setting up uh, the, the uh, queue of the, of the driver. Okay, um, data copies and, and buffer locations, they are moderately expensive. Now, I, I'm not, um, I, I cannot tell exactly how much of those 160 nanoseconds belong to the data copy and how much to the and buffer location because things uh, are, are mixed uh, one with the other. But uh, of course, if we find a way to uh, avoid the allocation and avoid the data copy and the uh, easy, easy solution is to memory map the buffers into user space, then we can save uh, that, uh, that cost altogether. Uh, there are other things uh, which are more related to the implementation of the protocol stack rather than to this specific application. For instance, we, uh, when we send packets on a connected socket, we, we compute all the headers again and again. And those operations are expensive. Perhaps it would be nicer if we had a way to compute them on, on, the, first, uh, on the first pass. And then on subsequent uh, transmission, cache the values for some time and try to use them instead of recomputing them all, all the time. <clears throat> so our, our strategy was uh, the following. In trying to optimize the system was first to address the, the, the easy problem in a way, raw packet I.O. And, and the reason was, 
of course, it's simple to simpler to handle because uh, I don't have to touch uh, many layers in the system. I can forget about the socket layer, the old IP and TCP stack, and, and whatever. I, I just uh, want to find a fast uh, bypass to the device driver or whatever I, I do instead of, uh, the, of the standard device driver. Uh, it's also poorly supported by current APIs. Uh, we have, uh, yes, we have cross sockets, we have VPF, but those are not very performant as we have seen. And it's, it's a useful way to determine the maximum achievable for performance. So there might be things that uh, are very expensive and unavoidable. And I, I want to know how much I can push the system before going into uh, revising the socket layer or the TCP stack or the IP stack. Also, it has a high return because there are many applications that can use it right away. Uh, so that was a, a nice uh, selling point. And our strategy was to do things as simply as possible. Um, Columbus X is here to remind us that. And uh, first of all, I didn't want to make, uh, uh, to rely on any uh, specific hardware features. Uh, people were suggesting uh, uh, IOMMU or, uh, I don't know, um, reliance on uh, checksum, uh, TC, uh, TCP offloading to the card, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Those are features that are going to be present on most cards, uh, sometimes with bugs, sometimes without. Uh, programming those features on, on, uh, on the particular device is not cheap because uh, you need to look at, for instance, at the other, and depending on uh, what the packet is, uh, do different operations, and so we are back to the Tetris game, and I didn't want to do that. So the, my, my, my first approach is, use nothing for the card. I used the technology that was there 10 years ago, perhaps. Uh, amortize the cost of certain operation, typically the system call or programming the device over large batches of packets when possible. Uh, remove unnecessary work, and this is uh, basically data copies and, and buff uh, allocation and freeze. And if possible, reduce the runtime decisions, and that's, uh, uh, that means uh, basically use a single frame format. And uh, the, the key point is don't be afraid of changing device driver. Oh, most of the solutions that I've seen rely on the standard device drivers because, of course, if, if you're going to touch the device driver, there are 40 of them, and uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, I, I thought that uh, if I design my system carefully, perhaps the device driver modification can be very limited, and, uh, and, and so I can gradually uh, update all the, all the drivers that, that I need. And that also helps in building a system that is maintainable rather than uh, one-off thing that is good to present to a conference and then dies because of lack of interest. So all, all, the, all the system that I designed uh, runs around the shared memory region, which is visible both to the kernel and to user space processes. And this region contains three types of uh, uh, data structures. Uh, we start from the bottom. We have packet buffers. They're all fixed sites. The default is 2K, it could be slightly larger, slightly smaller to, to get slightly better cache performance. Um, these uh, buffers are uh, numbered with uh, indexes from zero to a given maximum number. And uh, the buffers are used both by the user space application to read and write packets and from the NIC. And so the, there is a reference from the uh, ring implemented by the NIC to these buffers. Uh, user space doesn't see the, the NIC ring, the data structure managed by the network adapter, just because uh, I don't want user space to touch these data structures. This is very critical. It contains pointer uh, used by DMI engine, so it's, it's very dangerous to let the user program this one. So rather, I, I expose to user space a shadow copy of this ring, which is called the netmap ring, which has basically a circular array of uh, buffer indexes and lengths, and uh, some other information uh, that uh, help uh, the user program uh, find the current uh, insert uh, read or write point in, in the ring, and uh, tells uh, the user how many buffers are available for transmit or receive. And then, uh, since a card can have multiple transmit or receive ring, I have a higher level structure, which is called NetMap IF, which contains references to all uh, the various rings that, that are supported by the card and some metadata, so number of rings, size of the, of the rings, et cetera. The, this region, as I said, is uh, visible to the kernel and to one or more user space processes. And so these are mapped uh, into different types of spaces, so we cannot have direct pointers here, but just uh, 
storing them as references or offsets uh, that, uh, uh, sorry, as, uh, yeah, offsets or indexes in the case uh, of packet buffer works and uh, makes the translation very cheap in, in all the environments. So how, how does the system work? Basically, user space, and as we will see later, will play with these data structures, filling the buffers, uh, playing with the uh, ring, etc. And when it's time to pass the information to the kernel, it invokes a system call, which could be an IOCTL or Polo Selector, at, at which point the kernel validates the information on the ring and uh, uh, transfers uh, the, for instance, uh, buffer indexes, uh, sorry, buffer points and lengths into the NIC ring and start the transmission, or vice versa, when it's time to receive data, it uh, copies the information from the NIC ring into the uh, NetMap ring, updating the, the pointers. And we will see that in, in a moment. So basically, uh, the protection is provided by the operating system. And uh, apart from this shared memory region, there are no other, other critical uh, areas of the kernel that are exposed to user space. Yes? I, I don't. Uh, the, the idea is uh, these, uh, the, the system, that, the, the process that uh, plays with the network card is somehow a trusted process. Uh, I, I, I can trust someone, but not enough to, to let him play with, uh, with the NIC. Uh, the, but most of the damage that uh, the, the process can do is uh, um, destroy a packet, modify a packet while it's, the, the NIC is going to transmit it. Uh, and I have no protection against that because uh, the process in the first place could send me ro uh, bogus data to send out. So that, that's, that's my, 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 my view. I, I trust the process. Uh, the only thing I don't want the process to do is crash the system. All the rest, the process is responsible of the correctness of the data. Sorry? I, I only validate the packet sizes and, uh, and the buffer pointers. Because those are the things that can crash the system. If I, if I write a wrong address here, uh, I, I tell the NIC to DMA from or to some, some other region which might not be allocated. No, this cannot be changed because during the system, the programming of the NIC ring is done during the system call. And, uh, and basically, I, I read the data into, into the kernel, validate it, and write it back here. I, I read the data only once. Ah, okay, okay. It, uh, this is another story. So I was thinking about providing a protection, but the thing is I have no idea how user processes are going to use this ring. So again, I'm, I'm leaving a user process the responsibility of synchronize if they want to have multiple tries uh, playing with the rings. Because otherwise I would provide a mechanism that uh, is what I have in mind and perhaps doesn't fit the application or it's too expensive in certain cases. Okay. Um, Next. Am I here? Yes. Ownership. Who owns the data? Um, since it's shared between user space and, and the kernel. So um, you anticipated my, my comment on user space. If I have multiple threads uh, accessing the same shared memory region, uh, they're responsible for their own synchronization. Yeah. No, I haven't tested that. One, one thing that I, I'm testing now is the cost of copying data. But uh, changing the page tables is terribly expensive, I believe. You, you, you are probably more expensive than I am. Um, more. Yeah. Yeah, I have no idea of the timings, but could be in the hundreds of nanoseconds or pro possibly more. So you, you really don't want to do that. The, I, I was considering data copies because those are, those are slightly cheaper. In, in some cases. Anyways, so user space processes uh, uh, are responsible for their own synchronization. So what is left is synchronization between user space and the kernel. And this is very simple. So all the, the areas here, except for, with some exception, which I'll comment in a moment, are all, always owned by the user space process when it is running or blocked, but not, not in system code. When it is doing a system call, the ownership goes to the kernel. 
So uh, synchronization is implicit. And uh, basically, the, the exception is that some of the buffers uh, can be owned by the kernel. The buffers owned by the kernel are, are those outside the region between current and current plus avail, which uh, we, we told the user space uh, it can use. So basically, the, the set of buffers you can think of two, made of two parts. So one is uh, in use for user space to send or receive packets, and the other one is in use uh, by the kernel because of pending transmission or uh, buffers that are dedicated to uh, incoming packets. The, the important thing is that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, because of this partitioning and because all the updating of this shared memory region only occurs uh, during a system call in the context of the calling thread, the interrupt service routine never touch this shared region, so we don't need to synchronize on, on that. And this is also good in terms of uh, uh, cache behavior because uh, there is only one thread accessing this data and uh, nobody else can steal the the memory or overwrite the, the memory. Now, let's go uh, to see the API. Um, as, as in many cases, we need a handle to, to access this mechanism. And in our case, uh, it's not a socket, but it's a file descriptor, which is returned by opening a depth net map. It's just a name. Um, we get an unbound file descriptor. And we can bind it to a specific interface with an IOCTL. The argument has the name of the interface and optionally uh, which ring we want to bind if the interface has more rings. Uh, once the IOCTL returns and uh, it is successful, so it means that we have been granted access to the network interface, which is detached by the host stack. And we will see later how it happens. And in the argument, we also uh, we are also told uh, how large is this memory region and the offset of this uh, netmap IF structure within the region. So we map the region, and uh, once we have done it, uh, wherever there is space in the other space, we can access the netmap IF and all, and all the rest. When it's time to transmit, uh, we look at uh, the ring, one of the, one of the transmit rings that we are interested in, and uh, we start filling buffers uh, with the data that we want to transmit, update the information here in the rings, and then uh, we can call an IOCTL, uh, an IOTX sync. This is a non-blocking call, which does the validation I mentioned before, so it looks at the uh, pointers here, looks at the length and packet buffers. If they are correct, it updates the, net, the NIC ring and fires transmission on, on, on the NIC. And this is very cheap because typically we only copy a little bit of metadata and uh, we write to a register on, on the NIC. So terribly inexpensive. We don't have to follow chains of MBUFs to locate the, the payload. We don't have to copy the payload and so on. On the safe side, uh, we have a dual operation. Uh, an IOCTL is done before reading. Uh, it updates the uh, information in the NetMap ring. So if there are newly received packets, the metadata are copied into the ring, and uh, avail is incre increased by the number of newly received packets. And once we, the IOCTL returns, and this is non-blocking as well, uh, we know that there are five new packets, and um, starting at index uh, 24, and we find all the information here in the data. And once we are done uh, with the, these packets, done processing these packets, we advance the current pointer and uh, current index, and next time uh, we will tell the, next time the IOCTL is run, the kernel will know that those buffers are now free for uh, new uh, packet uh, receptions. <clears throat> of course, we don't, we are not happy with just uh, non-blocking calls. We want to synchronize with uh, events, uh, with packet arrivals, or completion of transmission. And uh, we have a standard way to do this. It's a pole or select, and we're just using that. And the, the way they work is uh, as expected. We, you pass pole or select a NetPub uh, file descriptor, and uh, it is reported as ready uh, when uh, the number of available buffers in the ring is greater than zero, which means that I either have room for transmission or I have uh, packets uh, that uh, have not been processed yet. I can decide the direction, uh, the, the set of rings on which I want to work with pull in or pull out. And also, the way the, the check is done, uh, optionally, mm -hmm. can, can be done whenever you get an interrupt. So if I have a card that does interrupt mitigation, those uh, delays are propagated to the user space process, which helps uh, keeping the load on the system under, under control. 
so I have two, two options, basically. One is the um, poll and select, which is very efficient in blocking. And if I want to poll the device to, to see if there is new uh, traffic coming in, for instance, I can use the IOCTL. There are more mechanisms that uh, can be implemented. For instance, a lot of new hardware has the ability of uh, writing uh, into some <coughs> memory location the current read uh, position or the current transmit position. And uh, probably in the, one of the next version of uh, NetMap, I'm going to extend the API so that the ring also will, will carry this information. So you can pull the device without having to, to do the system call, but just uh, looping on the, on the, on the field in memory that has this information. Uh, the way I support uh, cards with multiple uh, queues or system with multiple cores is completely straightforward. Uh, in the uh, IOCTL that uh, register the NIC, uh, registers the file descriptor with the NIC, I can optionally specify that I want to, to bind the, the file descriptor to a specific uh, ring pair, transmitter receive, instead of uh, the whole set of rings exported by the card by the card. So I can open multiple uh, file descriptors, bind them to different rings, and have uh, uh, different threads processing them, for instance. And if I want to bind a thread to a specific core, we have set affinity or whatever it's called, it's a p-thread call that uh, does the job for us. So we don't need any new mechanism to uh, split the work and, uh, and, and do the binding of threads to, to specific cores. And of course, uh, um, they are completely independent because the, the, the NIC itself manages the, the rings in a completely independent way. Yes? Uh, I'm going back to your slide now. Who owns what? You say that the user space is owned by the ring and the mm -hmm. So you have two fields here, current and avail. Right, right. And so think of this bottom part as, a, sorry, this will not come up in the recording. Um, that means current points here and avail is a count that says this buffer are for the user space. All the others are, are owned by the NIC. So, so basically the ownership is split. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing currently available, the user owns everything else, the, the network card. Exactly. So the thing is, these buffers could, might not even be there. Just because the user space doesn't own them, so it's not supposed to access them. So I can put uh, here some bogus indexes. In fact, I have two buffers that are reserved. Buffer 0 and buffer 1 are reserved. And uh, if you write there, one is junk for output and one is junk for, for input. So I, I yeah. Sorry, the NIC? No, no, it's all it's raw packets. So I supply the entire uh, the entire frame from the market mark and so on. So basically, the application has to actually take care of ARP and all that. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, raw IO mechanism. Okay, how do I talk to the host stack? Uh, when I'm working in NetMap mode. The host stack still believes the interface is there. And in fact, all the control parts are there. I can do an IF config, uh, I can change the speed, etc. The thing that I cannot do is, uh, well, I cannot do. I tried, the host still tries to send packets to the NIC and uh, hopes to receive packets from the NIC. What happens in practice is that I intercept uh, the transmit um, uh, function of, uh, of the interface and uh, I, I store the packets in one uh, extra ring uh, which is similar to the other ones that I saw. And, uh, from there, and I can access that ring also with the NetMap uh, mechanism. So I can have a NetMap file descriptor bind it to this uh, software ring. And the same for the other direction. When I want to send a packet uh, to, to the host stack, I have another NetMap ring uh, where the host stack uh, receives uh, packets from. So, um, and this is also uh, accessible to a NetMap uh, file descriptor. So basically, um, the, the way it works, uh, for instance, if I want to implement uh, a firewall or uh, some kind of filter between the network and the host, I can have a user space process that takes packets from the uh, rings connected to the NIC, uh, 
does uh, the filtering that he wants to do, and if the packet needs to go to the host stack, can push it to the netmap ring connected to the host stack. And the same in the other direction. And they have one very simple application that does the bridging between the two. So this, is an, uh, this way, at least, uh, I disconnect the interface from the host stack, but I don't lose the ability of uh, moving traffic back and forth. Um, Wait, yeah. This one, the, there is a delay that uh, because you're, you're going to the, to the user process, uh, there is a delay that uh, really kills you. It's about, uh, you, you basically have to schedule a process twice be, before having the, the packet to go, go up and down. So you lose something. I, I think I'm in the order of half a million packets per second instead of a million packets per second this way. Uh, I'm hoping to, to improve it a lot, but uh, um, Unless I, I, I overcome the, the scheduling delay, I'm not going to get good performance. There is one, one setting where this helps a lot, and is uh, within a virtual machine. If you have a virtual machine which emulates a device, uh, like an E1000, etc., and if you try to use NetSend on that virtual machine, I did a test on VMware, I get about 100,000 packets per second. If I instead put an interface in that map board and I interpose my, my process moving packets up and down, I go to 300,000 packets per second. Just because the emulation is completely different, and when I'm uh, in emulation mode in NetMap, uh, there is, I'm basically trapping only once per uh, batch of packet on a, on a single register access. So the, the emulation becomes uh, a lot more efficient. Um, what else? Okay, um, in doing this uh, um, transfer of information between the NIC and upstream, uh, this is partially, I mean, the, just moving the buffer from one, one ring or to the other one is a zero copy operation. Of course, when I do uh, the transfer between the netmap ring and the host stack, I need to uh, transform the netmap buffers into an mbuff and vice versa. If I get an mbuff, I need to transform it into a netmap buffer. So there is a data copy involved there. But uh, apart from that, uh, the, the, the rest is zero copy. Uh, the use of the API. Uh, so we are coming to the user space program. How, how, how can you make use of the mechanism? Of the mechanism? Do you need a library or, or, or you can do just plain coding yourself? And I, I believe it. It's really simple to use. Basically, it's this is real code for the packet generator that uh, I'm going to use in the next examples. I've lost the mouse again. Okay. Uh, you so you get a file descriptor. You write the name of the interface that you want to bind into the argument to, to the ARCTL. Uh, run the ARCTL. Assuming it's okay, the result is okay. You memory map the region, and then you I have a few macros in the header that uh, help me converting. Uh, information, uh, the offsets into actual pointers. So this one gives me the, uh, the pointer to this data structure. And then, for instance, this is a typical traffic generator. So I run uh, around the pole, uh, which uh, wakes up when uh, there is room for transmission. And then I scan all the, all the rings that are available on that particular uh, netmap of hard descriptor. Uh, locate the ring uh, until there is space. I locate the buffer, store the information in the buffer, uh, write the length in the slot, uh, and advance the, the current pointer. And once I'm done, next time I'm going to call Paul, it will also uh, push out uh, uh, the packets by validating the content of the ring, uh, programming the, ne the NIC, and so on. I have, and uh, I have not implemented it yet. Um, the KQ is not completely cheap as a mechanism. The, the, there is a lot of <laughs> locking involved in, uh, in passing the events through to, to the queue. But it makes, sense, it makes a lot of sense, for instance, if you want to, to build a switch in user space, which has multiple uh, um, file descriptors connected to it. Um, so this is an example instead of how you can do zero copy bridging between interfaces. And that's completely straightforward because basically you take a buffer from a receive interface. Uh, once you know the output interface, you just swap the buffer from the receive ring with the buffer from uh, the transmit ring. And so in a, 
with the swapping, you move the packet out and also get a fresh buffer for the next uh, uh, receive operation. In terms of code size, the, because it's quite compact, uh, despite uh, a lot of comments, the, the body of NetMap is just 2,000 lines of uh, C code. In one, well, a couple of files, I've split in the memory allocator now. Um, and then I have uh, uh, three headers, basically. One is common to user space and the kernel. The other one is just for the user macros that I showed before, NetMap AF, etc. And another one is used by the kernel and the device driver. And then I have device driver modifications, um, uh, which I will show in a moment how they are done. But basically, they are between three and 500 lines of code each. Uh, so far, I've modified these devices. Uh, no, BGE is not really working now. Uh, there are three Intel devices, uh, one gig, uh, the 10 gig, Realtek uh, one gig, and uh, the Linux version uh, also has an NVIDIA driver. Does it help? <laughs> Uh, the pickup emulation library is only uh, is very small. Basically, I only need to uh, <laughs> implement a couple of functions to inject packets or to uh, process incoming packets, and the rest is all glue to to open uh, to provide the, the equivalent of pickup open live and uh, a few other things. Pickup has uh, multiple methods of doing the same thing, unfortunately. So. For every basic function, I need to implement all, all of the variants, otherwise program. Sure, this one? Or? Sorry? OK, this is an old style. It's now both in head, relink it, and nine. This was written when I had a prototype, which was not committed yet. So it's, it's, it's in nine? It's already nine. What is not in nine, and I haven't just found the time to put in is the device driver modifications. But uh, it's a quick thing. You can basically take the, the, the drivers from head and use them in, in nine if you want. So how, how do I modify the device drivers? Since we are in a free BSD forum, uh, I hope that people, uh, um, vendors, <laughs> will, uh, will be able to extend NetMap uh, support to their hardware. So I, I need to, so the, 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 the way I structure the thing is to uh, implement a few extra methods in, uh, that are used by NetMap uh, generic function. Uh, one is to register the interface in NetMap mode or put it back to the standard uh, mode of operation. Another one is to export the, the locks that the interface might, might use, and some don't, so I have a default uh, method that we can use for that. And then I have uh, two uh, callbacks, and one is called TXSync and the other RxSync, which, which are basically uh, used to, to do the validation of the NetMap ring and uh, uh, program the NIC in one direction and the same in the other direction when reading packets. And these are called uh, either on the IOCTL or doing the, the poll. Um, so the, the modification is typically done uh, like this. I, uh, if uh, the dev NetMap option is set in the kernel config file, I include a header which has all the NetMap uh, modification. I, I could put them in line, but uh, sometimes this is vendor code and uh, uh, they, they want to minimize the impact on, on their own code. So it, I find this, this approach uh, slightly easier to, to maintain. Uh, this header actually contains some uh, C function, not just uh, 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 declaration and concept, but also function. Anyways, uh, it's poor practice, but it, uh, it's very effective in making the system maintainable. Um, so, and then I have a few patches uh, through the device driver, basically uh, one in the, in, in the code that initializes the transmit ring, one in the code that initializes the receive ring. Uh, in the interrupt service routine, what I typically do is, that, uh, is the following. If I am in NetMap mode, which is uh, reported by one of the flags in the capabilities, then I just uh, do a cell wake up on, on the processes that might be sleeping and waiting for a notification and then return. Otherwise, I, I continue with the standard processing. And that's all the processing that is done in the interrupt service routine in NetMap. There's nothing else. And, and then I have a small chunk in the init routine that uh, uh, binds the NetMap, uh, an extension of the IFNet uh, 
uh, to the Ashwala Fnet. Um, a few comments on the behavior of the system. Uh, I'm a bit short of time, so I better hurry up. Um, when I'm running in NetMap mode, uh, one of the typical phenomena that uh, we have in uh, uh, interrupt-based drivers, which is live lock. So we are spending a lot of work in the interrupt service routine, and then we might not have uh, uh, CPU in user space to, to continue the work. Uh, doesn't occur because all the processing is done by the user space process. So we have a very nice way of controlling the, the load of the system. Um, all, all, all the manipulation on the ring, as I said, it is done in the upper half of the kernel, basically in the thread context, uh, when the, during the AOCTL or, or the poll. And uh, well, there, there are some optimization in Poland Select. Uh, so playing with application, I noticed that, for instance, many, many pickup receiver are um, not very well written, and so they issue multiple uh, uh, read requests, even though they, they were notified in advance that they had multiple packets to receive. They only process one, and they go to poll again then, so I optimize this case. I also noticed that many uh, pickup receivers, after a poll, they issue a, a get time of day to, time, to have a timestamp for the packet, so I, I decided to, to put a timestamp right into the NetMap ring, so this can be used by uh, application without having to pay the extra system call. And also, uh, if I do a, a poll or select on, uh, on, um, for, for reading on a file descriptor, if there are packets to be sent out on, on the same file descriptor, I push them out anyways. And so that also saves an extra system call. And that all contributes to making the application faster. Um, there are a couple of slides on how I implemented the two functions that Pickup provides to inject packet or receive traffic. And inject is very simple. I, I just need to find a slot in the, in the ring and uh, copy the information from, uh, um, from the uh, user supplied buffer to, to the slot and then uh, return or because in, in the end uh, at the next poll the, push, the packets will be pushed out. On the receive side, I don't even need to do the copy because the interface is very nice. Uh, Pickup dispatch tells the system to apply a callback on uh, a certain number of packets, so I can apply the callback uh, directly on the buffers that uh, are visible uh, already in, in uh, user space. And in terms of performance, uh, um, I try to measure transmitter receive performance, uh, forwarding performance with some application um, on the same machine that I mentioned before, I7. Uh, it's 70, uh, 3 gigahertz with uh, one or more cores and variable CPU frequency. So this is the graph we saw before. Uh, changing the CPU speed, uh, the packet generator goes from uh, 2 million packets per second at uh, 150 megahertz to line rate at uh, 40 million, at uh, 900 megahertz. If I use uh, two cores, I get line rate at about uh, 450 megahertz. With four cores, I'm uh, at 8 million packets per second at 150, and the next point I have is 300 megahertz, and I do my rate, so it's quite efficient. Um, the received performance is similar, but we will see that in a moment. Uh, much of the gain comes from the fact that I'm issuing a system call every many packets, several packets. If I were to issue a system call every, every, every packet or every two packet, of course, I, I get worse performance. And uh, this basically measures, this graph measures the overhead of the poll system call. Uh, so I, I changed the batch size, so the, the number of packets between calls to, to poll. And uh, what I see is that uh, with a batch size of one, I get about 2 million packets per second. Uh, increasing the batch size are more or less increased linearly up to line, getting to line rate when the batch size is eight. So it's pretty efficient anyways. But we do need some batching to, to to reach really high speed. On the receive side, uh, um, with the changing, with the variable packet sizes, uh, we have a strange phenomenon which I've discussed multiple times on the list and uh, with people at Intel. It seems that when the packet size is not a multiple of 64, then the, uh, the chipset probably does a read modify write cycles on the bus. And uh, that means that, for instance, packet size of, sizes of 65 cannot do line rate just because there is too much traffic on, uh, on, the, on the PCI bus. And then you get uh, back to line rate at 128, uh, and then uh, 
the next good point uh, is 144, which is not a multiple of 64, but uh, is the point where the, the bus has enough capacity uh, to sustain the read modified write uh, cycles. And then everything goes uh, as uh, expected, so the packet, uh, packet rate is uh, one over packet size. And this is a, a phenomenon that I've seen on both uh, Linux and FreeBSD on the Intel card. On the AMD, I have something similar, but uh, the, the throughput is slightly higher. I think it's around 12, 12 or 13 million packets per second. So it's definitely something that depends on, on the chipset. Uh, one way to avoid this, for instance, would be that uh, when you are writing data to memory, uh, you don't use the exact value that you have received, but just uh, um, extend to the next multiple of 64. There is enough capacity on, on the system. And in terms of porting application, uh, these were some initial tests that we were doing. So for instance, if you take FreeBSD bridging, it does about 700,000 packets per second, but uh, NetMap uh, if you use NetMap uh, uh, with the zero copy trick that I mentioned, you can do uh, forwarding between interface at line rate with one core at 1.7 gigahertz. Of course, this is with the 64 byte packets. If you go to 65, performance drops. If you use OpenV switch, uh, the original software is really poor uh, because it's poorly written. If you, we, it has a single event loop which does everything, including uh, uh, talking to the controllers, and uh, the best thing is it does is process only one packet per iteration. Um, so uh, splitting the event loop in two and doing the obvious optimization brings the performance to about 800 packets per second, and replacing LipiCup with NetMap, uh, coming to that, uh, we get to 3 million packets per second. Yes? So, you have the the yes. Uh, there is, yes, I think so. There are some patches that I posted. I, if they're not linked on my NetMap page, I, I will post them. I'll send you a email. Okay, okay. But uh, remember, th this software is really poor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, everything is called uh, John. There is a class called John, which uh, has uh, a variable called John and a member called John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's even difficult to talk to people about code because everything has the same name. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> so anyways, and the other thing we reported was uh, Click. For those of you who don't know, who don't know it, Click is a very nice tool uh, written by Eddie Kohler. Uh, which uh, lets you uh, define elements uh, programming in C++ uh, which do some packet processing and uh, there is a kind of a scripting language where you connect the elements and uh, you can build packet processing graph which are really, really efficient. In a way, it's similar to NetGraph. Um, but um, it has two versions. It, one is in uh, user space and the other one is in the kernel, but basically it's the same code. It's, I, I think it's much easier to use than, than NetGraph just because you can write standard C++ code in user space and uh, the binding is uh, through this uh, very easy to use scripting language. But anyways, for some time a lot of network research was done using Click because the internal version had very good performance. And the, the basic test we used was a graph that uh, was doing packet forwarding bidirectionally between two interfaces. And uh, Linux, in, the internal version of Linux did about 2 million packets per second. The LipiCup version did about 400,000 packets per second. And replacing LipiCup with the NetMap version, we got to 3 million packets per four, about 4 million packets per second. It didn't come for free because uh, the initial attempt uh, only got us a threefold improvement. Uh, but the, the fact was that C++ memory allocation, uh, allocator was terribly slow and replacing that with our own allocator uh, got us to this very good performance. So you, you find a lot of stuff on NetMap uh, on my web page. There's uh, code presentations, uh, measurements, uh, papers. Uh, the code is already committed to FreeBSD, the top three versions. The device driver modification are only in head, but I'm going to push them to the, to the other one soon. Uh, I have a Linux version. Uh, which might not make, make its, its way in the, in the Linux source tree, but I don't care too much. Um, I have modified drivers 
modification for these device drivers and hopefully others to come. Future work, what can we use this for? Apart from uh, packet sniffing, for instance, uh, last week I was taking a few uh, applications uh, using LipPickup and trying to use NetMap on them. We trying to use them on the NetMap version of LipPickup, and I got uh, very good speed ups on most of them. Um, it would be nice, for instance, if you, we had fully transparent operation, instead of having to use a user process to move packets up and down, uh, I would like to have uh, packets uh, uh, coming from the stack go, out, go outside, even if the interface is in network mode, and packets, uh, incoming packets go to the host stack if they're not reclaimed by the user space application. Another uh, place where NetMap uh, or something like this could be useful is to implement a virtual switch between uh, uh, virtual machine instances. Uh, just because the, the data model is, is so simple, the, the processing of packets, the bridging of packets between uh, NetMap rings is very, very, uh, very cheap. And this is something I'm going to explore next. And the other, the other area uh, where it could be nice to do some experimentation is to see whether using the uh, NetMap representation of packet or rings could improve the performance in the system. For instance, I have a version of IPFW that runs in user space. So the kernel part is compiled in user space and can use the NetMap hooks to uh, intercept traffic. I haven't uh, had uh, yet the, the time to do uh, performance measurement on this. But uh, a big amount of the time spent in IPFW is uh, just for moving packets and uh, uh, going through the buffs uh, to extract the, the fields that we need. Having a plain uh, packet format uh, might uh, improve the, the performance a lot. And also, this gives us the opportunity to do some benchmarking. Before, because until now, if I wanted to do some benchmarking on uh, IPFW or any packet filter, uh, I needed to um, figure out how much time was spent in the stack, and this was a lot, for moving packets up and down, and then there is a small amount of time, perhaps uh, 30 nanoseconds uh, per instruction or 200 nanoseconds to enter the, the firewall, etc., which I want to measure, which is really noise in, in, the, in the big chunk of time which is consumed by the network traffic. This way, uh, the, the packet uh, I.O. is uh, the noise, and uh, all, the time, all the time is basically consumed in processing in the IPFW code, and which is what I want to measure. Um, OK. There is also some not NetMap related announcement that might be useful to, to, to implement that came out during this experimentation. For instance, I found out that BCopy is very, very expensive uh, depending on packet size. So it might be worthwhile to uh, either round up the, the sizes of the copies to multiple of 8, 16, 64 bytes, whatever it is, if we have room, uh, or use inline uh, routines or otherwise. Uh, this stuff is going to save you perhaps 10 nanoseconds in every place we do that, but uh, as I said, our budget per packet is very limited. So in the end, if we shave uh, 100 nanoseconds of the packet processing, that means a great improvement in our throughput. Um, the other thing uh, could be to avoid repeated computations in our, in our network stack, and uh, I mentioned the uh, IP headers and the MAC headers, and this is something that we do on every packet and turns out to be very expensive. OK, um, sorry, yeah, it was a bit long. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, uh, when you described your host comparison against the uh, Linux version of the uh, OBS uh, switch, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the data kernel mode. So, when, so you, when, I use, uh, when I did the experiment, I used the uh, user space version of OpenV switch. So so the, the, the story is the following. Open switch comes uh, with the uh, Linux kernel module, module which does the forwarding, or it can do the forwarding in user space, also on Linux. We extended it uh, to do forwarding in user space on FreeBSD using the pickup. Okay. And then we tried to measure it, and the performance was this, 0.65. It turns out that the performance of the user space version on Linux is even lower than ours. But never mind. So I thought, OK, Linux in kernel mode, uh, the, might be faster, and I measure 300,000 packets per second. Okay. And if you look at the papers, the papers support uh, about uh, a gigabit per second speed, eh? but then it's with large frames, so more or less it's the same throughput. Okay, so when you do the, uh, the NASMOP, FreeBSD plus MEMMAP, is that uh, still in the user space? 
this is still in user space using LibPickup, but uh, with our patches, which splits the event loop in two, and uh, with the LibPickup that runs on top of that. Oh, so you don't have to build the kernel module? No, no, not at all. OK, okay there, there was uh, him, and then I come to you. Why don't you let him go first? My question's going to be long. OK. <laughs> This one? I'm I'm saturating the link anyways, so it's 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 what whatever is the theoretical uh, packet rate. Okay. Gotcha. So I'm saturating also at minimum packet size. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So make it short. <laughs> No, we have some time. I mean, the next talk is enough and all. I'm going to ask a question. Is, the, is your goal here to actually make this a general purpose programming paradigm, or are you, just, you thinking it's specifically for networking? And the reason I'm asking is, is I'll, I'll let you answer that, and then I'll have a further question. Um, for now, I've only thought uh, about this for networking. So. Okay. The, the reason I ask is because this has a lot of, uh, a lot of similarity to stuff like OFED. There was the work called Modular Via back in 98 that I was involved in that actually is very similar to this, um, and which meant it's a general framework and actually answers, or I would say addresses some of the questions that you sort of asked uh, during the presentation have to do with, I mean, the model there was the memory was owned by user land and then it was registered, mm -hmm. which, is, and which is why it's just kind of the way Infinite Net happened, mm -hmm. because it came from, that's where it came from. And uh, a lot of the error semantics That's okay. One of the things that you kind of didn't talk about either is that if you if you want to write an application, you want to deal with what happens when I fail, what happens when a packet gets missed, what happens, all sorts of other things, um, uh, and that's why I was asking the questions. If you make mainly mainly focusing it towards networking, then, then uh, this yeah, packet losses on networking are not that important right. because yeah, we have ways to recover. But we can talk about that yeah, offline, sure. perhaps. Yes. Well. It does. It does use BuzzDMA. Yeah, but not, not fully. It's Why not? Uh, it's miss, missing uh, BuzzDMA sync calls. Uh, no, it does. It does have them. And it's uh, using two byte macro, so. Uh, it's using thing. what? So not anymore. Okay. Anyways, I, I have to say, if if you have a device which uses bounce buffers, there's no point in using that map. So, uh, so two two parts of the answers for the the bus DMA calls. Uh, I thought I put all of them in in the code. If I miss some, uh, please let me know so I, I can fix that. The second thing, uh, as uh, as as I said before, if you need to do the bus buffers, uh, then you're screwed anyway. So there's probably no hope to to have uh, netmap working at uh, full speed on on those platforms. Anyways, the bus DMA calls are device driver specific. There's nothing about that in the in the generic code. So you can have a slow device with uh, all the compatibility that, that you want and the fast device that uh, don't need to use bus DMA, for instance. Uh, the, the, I don't know, the Intel cards uh, mostly work on IT86 platform and the, the bus DMA ops, there are no operations. Okay, uh, there are no other questions. Uh, thank you and close here. <laughs>